I always so, wanted to be on a burning platform. Yeah, it feels like we're in Hawaii, not in uh, Finland. So my name's Simon Levine. I'm a partner at Mosaic Ventures, which is a London-based venture capital fund focusing on Series A investments. We historically have done a lot of games investing, as well as other consumer businesses, software. We're really enjoying Slush. Uh, I'm here actually deputizing for my partner, Mike Chalfin, who was the first investor uh, at King, or as it was then, Midas Player, some 10 years ago in Ricardo's company. And I wanted to introduce Ricardo, who's the founder and CEO of King, which, as many of you know, is one of the most successful European startups of the last decade, recently sold to Activision in the US for a hefty sum. So, Ricardo, welcome to the King stage. Thank you, and thank you guys for being here. As a, as a first question, I think a lot of the people in the audience would love to know a little bit about your, your life story. You know, I don't know if you want to start in kindergarten, but just tell us a little bit about where you come from, how you came to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. So I think, I mean, I might take 20 minutes for that. Uh, I'll keep it short. Um, I'm Italian. I started, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur, but I had no clue what to do. And I kept always my choices open. I think the key, key moment in my life was in 1999, when I joined a very small startup called Spray. There were about 20 people at the time. And it's in Sweden, is that right? In Sweden, yeah. It was basically a portal. And we got $100 million uh, in financing. We more or less burned through it. We went from 20 to 800 people in one year. But we learned a lot of things there. We ended up selling the company to Lagos Europe. So it was not all so bad. Uh, but it unfortunately, it was in stock and not in, sh in shares, not in, uh, not in cash. And the stock went down from 10.2 to 0 0.3 in a very short time. When the bubble burst. But among those 800 people, I met the founders, the co my co-founders, amazing guys. And uh, that's how we started King in 2003. And so, can you tell us a little bit about the process with, with your co-founders? How many of you were there? Why did you pick games as the, the sector that you wanted to yeah. spend time? Because 2003, that was very far-sighted. Yeah, basically, in 99, we started with a portal which offered a lot of different products, among which we had communities, we were very strong on communities, and on dating, we created one of the first dating sites. So after that, after we sold it to Lycos, I went into online dating, and we sold the, the company in 2002. And then I said, okay, what next? And in 2002, it was a time where games were mainly played for free online, or on console or PCs. Uh, and when you were playing them online, you were either playing them for free or you were downloading them and playing, in, playing them by yourself. And so we started with a model which, at the time in Europe, was new, where you could play with others in competitions online, and there was a business model behind where you could also play for prizes. So we had an idea which was new, and so this idea catalyzed, uh, catalyzed us as founders, and we said, okay, we actually know the, we know the area. We did games before at Lycos. Uh, we thought the idea was new, and therefore it was easier to promote it and we put in our own money. So we tried to raise money, but 2003 was a very toxic year for raising money online. Online was kind of you know, off. Um, and so we, put, we went all in with our own money. And uh, we almost went bust at the end of 2003 because we managed to get on board an angel with busy two hours before shutting down. Wow. So that's, uh, and at that time, you know, I guess 03 is, is almost sort of two eras ago in, 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 in web time. Could you have imagined that the company that you started would have grown to be what it is today? Was that part of the vision that you would end up somewhere like where you are? Or no, what was your it, ambition at that time? Of course not. I mean, it was impossible to imagine that the company would have grown from 
you know, a six-person company to now over 2,000 people. Uh, and it was actually not the key thing. The key thing was to work on something which was our own thing, something where we saw opportunities and to work with great guys. And we never ran out of ideas. So it was always kind of growing, okay, how do we build from here? What are the opportunities? How do we build it further? And after a while, it became bigger and bigger. And in those first sort of one or two years, what were the, the hardest lessons? It sounds like fundraising was very challenging, which a lot of people in the audience can resonate with. Recruiting, you know. Well, if, if, I, if I tell the story in, in, in brief, we had different sta several different stages. The first stage, which was really, really tough, was the starting from the scratch. We put in our own money. Uh, when you put in our, your own money, you want to make sure you can go for as long as possible. So we reduced the costs to zero. Just to give you an example, I had a car, gave away the car. Had a flat, gave away the flat. Uh, a friend of mine basically was very nice. He told me I could stay at his place for, I stayed there basically for two and a half years in his guest room, uh, which was great. Uh, and th so the first phase was rough. We almost ran out of money. We managed to close an angel, uh, two angel in investors in the last minute. But then we became profitable very fast. We became profitable after a year and a half from launch in January 2003. And if someone asks me what is the most important date in the history of the company, it was not the launch of Candy Crush in November of 2002. It was when we became profitable for the first time in January 2003. Sorry, in January of 2005. Right. Uh, because, and we've been profitable since then. And the reason why is that if you are profitable, you have degrees of freedom. You can do what you think is right rather than doing what you think investors want to hear. So it's customers financing you rather than VCs like me and... <laughs> Well, you can do that what is right. And so that, that was the most important, the first date. Then we managed to, through distribution partnerships, to grow the business. We, we signed a deal with Yahoo, which I took remember. us first to Europe. Yeah, yeah and yeah. you were there. And, and then to the US, which was also one of these deals which uh, leveraged the company to the next stage. And then we had, I had probably the toughest time in my life in uh, 2009. In uh, 2009 is the year where Facebook, if you plot Facebook, the Facebook growth, uh, 2009 is the year where the Facebook growth went basically exponential. And uh, we were not on Facebook. Yahoo was our largest partner. And Yahoo lost 45% of their traffic in games in one year between March 2009 and April 2010. And when you are in, in there, in the woods, you don't, you, don't, you don't know, or you know that Facebook is growing, but you can't imagine it is growing so fast. And it was as if someone had taken a carpet under our feet. And so we thought that we had technical issues, technical bugs, and we doubled our investment in hardware and still didn't help. And to crack Facebook, how to bring our games to Facebook took us about a year and a half, almost two years. And it was a very tough time to manage both internally and externally towards our investors. So if I remember that era, there were a number of kind of first mover games, social games companies on Facebook, uh, Zynga, uh, Playfish, Playdom. In an in a ironic way, and we can say this now, kind of looking back retrospectively, being a second mover where you had that 18 months to rebuild and retool turned out to be a blessing or an advantage. Is that, yeah. is that how you felt at the time? Were you confident about your strategy or was it more a, a kind but of reset for you? I think our strategy was to experiment. and. I think we also experimented before to bring our games to Facebook, but I think the fact that we were really at the, uh, you know, uh, at the border, to, 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 we had to do things differently. And so that's where, in 2009, we, I had to take, we had to take a decision which was very rough to say, okay, you know what, we have 110 people, it's not enough to experiment on the side with a small team, we need to do things differently. So we put the live games on, uh, on a live string, so 50% of the, of the team worked on the live games uh, with zero innovation, very little in, basically updates. And, most, and, and the other 50% of the team was split up in five different projects, uh, which were different projects, and, uh, and experimenting different routes to, to crack the problem. And then one of these games, one of these games suddenly succeeded in March of, 2000, of 2011. And then we improved continuously from there. So, I think that, uh, yeah, there was a strategy, but strategy was not in terms of, hey, we know this is going to work, but is, is, we don't know what is going to work, so let's, let's try different things 
and uh, let's set up for experimentation. And obviously, King is most well known for Candy Crush, which has become a, a global phenomenon. Just to sort of help the audience understand, how many games in total has the company developed? You know, before Candy Crush, and uh, so we developed more than 200 games. Uh, but I think that Candy Crush would have never existed without those 200 games because we have learned, we've created games across the entire spectrum of casual games, all different genres, and within the same genre we have done many multiple games. And then we came up with a really core, very strong gameplay. And at the same time, in March 2011, we cracked how can we take this very strong gameplay to Facebook in a different way. And then we have optimized this, we call it envelope, so that we can repurpose any of the strong games we developed over the 11 years uh, for Facebook and, late, and then later for mobile. And, and so if I can sort of paraphrase, there's a, a strong kind of product-driven creative studio at the heart of the company. H how important has been that as an engine in terms of the DNA of the company, the people? Has there been continuity there? I mean, because many other games companies have grown by acquisition or bolting on different things. We, we are big believers that if the product is good, marketing is easy. If the product is not differentiated, is not, does not create user value, marketing is tough, and then you only compete on price. So we've been from the, the, the origin of the company was because we had something which was new, was different. Uh, and so a key, you know, we've always believed that we have to focus first of all on the product. And so we are now uh, investing more than ever in innovation, putting a large part of our users, of our, of our team on, on new things. And when you look at, I guess, the number you mentioned um, a few minutes ago, 110 people that's now grown to 2,000, how much of that is product, developers, the creative side of the business, and how much of it is sales, marketing, kind of the commercial front end? The vast majority is, is developers right. uh, and creatives and tech. Uh, and then we have a team of about 100 people basically in, in marketing and uh, marketing and customer service. So the majority is, uh, is technology. So I want to fast forward because there's some other lessons from the company that I think are very instructive for the audience. You're one of the very few European-based companies that chose to IPO and go public in the US on the New York Stock Exchange. Tell us about that experience. Why, why did you decide to go public? If you look back, was that the right decision to do? Well, we had reached a size uh, which was too large for a potential acquisition. And we had institutional investors on board with Apex and Index Ventures. And so we wanted to set up the company for the long term so that they didn't, didn't need to sell their stock or find a buyer to, to basically have an exit. And so we, for, we did an IPO for this reason. We IPO'd on the New York Stock Exchange at around $7 billion. And it was my first time uh, public market CEO. So I had to bring on board people who had done it before. We brought on board a star CFO and a very, very strong team behind with the chief uh, legal officer, etc. cetera. Um, so it was a new learning. We did the biggest tech IPO in Europe probably also at the same time, unfortunately, one of the worst IBOs. Uh, so was you a learn... a tough time in the market at that moment. It was... Yeah, we had a bit to fight with the model that, you know, they think that games is, is a one-hit wonder. And we had to prove that it's actually, we have a relationship with our users, it's a live game. It's not just that the game is out and that's it. So we had to, to prove the case. And, uh, and you do it because it's a recurring business. For me, it was personally a very, a great learning curve. Uh, I think what you learn is that, A, you need to uh, professionalize the entire company in terms of, hey, uh, we need to do what we say we will do. Uh, and so we, you need to manage the markets in a careful way. At the same time, internally, you also need to make sure that uh, we, are, um, we, do, we, we do what we say we will do in terms of launch times, et cetera, et cetera. And but at the same time, focusing always on the long term, which is the, a bit the, the tricky thing to do all at the same time. And so to fast forward to the present day, after going public, you and the board took the decision to sell to Activision Blizzard, which is obviously one of the bigger company, games companies in the world. 
and you're now an important part of that company's future, you're still public, but no longer as transparent as a pure play um, social games company. How have you found working in that larger entity, still public, still visible, but where you're an important division of, of, of a larger whole? Well, the reason for the deal was not just because you know, the investors had a way to, to monetize their investment, uh, but there, there was a business logic behind. And I, we always thought, okay, when we announce the deal, not only we announce it to the markets, but more importantly for me, we announce it to our team. And so I wanted the team to say, hey, the, fantastic, this is great. And if you think of, of what the, now the combination basically is, we have the best IPs in the market on console, on PC, and on mobile. We have more players playing our games than the entirety of the United States of America every month. And so I think there are great opportunities by bringing our expertise and our reach on mobile um, and our brands on casual with the expertise, the brands, the knowledge, the team, which has created the most legendary, iconic games on, on, uh, on web and, uh, and, uh, and console. And I guess if this is a, an overarching question, but if you look back sitting here in the sort of on the cusp of 2017, all the way back to 2013, sorry, 2003 when you started the company, um, how important was luck or serendipity in the progress and how, how much of it was making your own luck or planning? I mean, it, it, it's a, a long journey that you've yeah. taken with many chapters. Well, look, I have the biggest respect for every entrepreneur and I believe there are many here. So, you know, I have head off for every and each person here because you need to take your, uh, you know, you take risks and you go all in. And my advice to everyone is, everyone has luck. Luck is something which everyone comes through. So it's only a question of time. If, you're, if the people are good, it's only a matter of time. So the most important thing is not luck, it's perseverance and also taking, taking your chances. So not to, you know, not to let opportunities go, but take them. And, and this means also setting up a culture where failure is part of the model, rather than trying to be, to run too safe. If you, you know, if you, if you don't, if you, if you don't fall, this means you're not running fast enough. So take risks, otherwise you're not, you're not in the game. And then I guess last question, if you, if you could look back and do one thing differently, if, this is not so much a regret, but if, if, if if you had the benefit of hindsight, what, what might you have done differently? Obviously, it's been a great outcome, so... Uh, I made so many mistakes. If I could go back, I would do so many things differently. But, you know, I think that it's, it's part of the model. So uh, I'm trying still to learn, and I think that's what drives me also going forward. Ricardo Zacconi, thank you very much. Thank you for coming here and for listening. <laughs>